great reform ideas that day, but the issue that got the most mentions were staffing and building internal capacity. Uh, it's no secret that Congress has had a hard time retaining talented staff. This committee has heard from a number of staffing experts and has had countless discussions about recruitment, retention, and diversity. We keep talking about it because we know that the future of this institution depends on its workforce. So today, um, we're going to focus on a different aspect of staffing, and that's expertise. It's what staff take with them when they leave the Hill. Over the past several decades, the policy agenda has expanded and become increasingly complex. In the past couple of months alone, we've been confronted with a global pandemic, a public health crisis, an economic crisis, uh, soaring unemployment, uh, comprehensive police reform is also on the agenda. So Congress is addressing all of these difficult issues while simulta simultaneously figuring out how to work remotely. Uh, it's a lot, and it goes to show why we need reliable expertise at our fingertips. We all want to be as smart as we can on all of these issues so that we can better serve the American people. Congress has really bright staff working in its office, uh, in committees and support agencies, but they're spread thin as it is. The more time Congress spends playing catch up on the ma major policy debates of the day, the less able it is to act as a co-equal branch of government. As members of this committee know, congressional member organizations, CMOs, can be a great resource for pooling expertise and ideas for legislation. Select committee members alone belong to the RSC, the CBC, the New Dems, the Progressive Caucus, the Women's Caucus, and much more. These organizations give members a forum for discussing issues that span congressional districts and for developing policy positions and coalition building. Collaborating with colleagues on issues of national importance is good for the institution. And maybe there's more we can do to support CMOs. I'm looking forward to hearing what the experts joining us today have to say about building expertise in Congress. I'm also interested in hearing their thoughts on how we can strengthen opportunities for members to share knowledge and cross collaborate. Uh, before turning it over to Vice Chair Graves, let me just say this virtual discussion will run like the others. After the Vice Chair finishes his remarks, I'll introduce our experts, give them five minutes each to share some thoughts. Then we'll move to questions and members will have five minutes each. It's expected that votes will be called, so we'll go get through as much as we can, as fast as we can. And with that, let me turn it over to Vice Chair Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I want to thank you for letting us um, conduct this meeting in a virtual manner, uh, you know, through video as well as audio, such as myself, um, because quite frankly, that's how as we've discussed, our staff and other staff, uh, committee staff, and and many businesses are having to operate and conduct their their uh, their activities today. So this is a, a great example of how this can be done, uh, because over the last year and a half, this committee it's prioritized reforms to make Congress work better for the American people, and uh, you've demonstrated that here today. How we can continue that and and have that continuity of of work. Uh, but this this means that at times uh, we we got to address some of the nitty gritty day to day operations of the House that uh, our constituents they rarely see, and uh, and 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 they're probably thankful they don't get to see all the nitty gritty that that has to go on. But it's uh, why we've continued to look as a committee at staffing reforms, and why when we held our member day hearing that you referenced uh, last year, and many of our colleagues they highlighted that need to invest in expertise and to create an environment where we have diverse perspectives from staff who want to stay and help strengthen the legislative branch. So today's discussion, that's a continuation of that feedback and the, and the conversations that we've had uh, so far. So I know many of us are, uh, are members of groups like the Republican Study Committee or the New Democratic Coalition, among other caucuses within the House of Representatives that contribute strongly uh, strong perspectives and policy ideas uh, to the to our discourse and discussion as we uh, um, uh, conduct our business. So it's important that we continue supporting the expertise and policy ideas shared by these groups and really allow the legislative branch to invest in itself to regain our constitutional duties as a co-equal branch of government. Uh, so thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for conducting uh, this discussion today, and I'll yield back. Terrific. Uh, we are joined today by three uh, great experts. Uh, Lee Drutman is a senior fellow in the Political Reform Program at New America Foundation. He's the author of Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, The Case for Multi-Party Democracy in America, and The Business of America is Lobbying, winner of the 2016 American Political Science Association's Robert A. Dahl Award, given for scholarship of the highest quality on the subject of democracy. He's also the co-host of the podcast Politics in Question and writes for the New York Times, Fox, and 538, among other outlets. 
Paul Braithwaite served for six years as the executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus under three CBC chairs, Representatives Eddie Bernice Johnson, Elijah Cummings, and Mel Watt. As executive director, Paul worked for all 43 members of the CBC and coordinated both domestic and foreign policy legislative initiatives for the CBC. He also worked for Senator Tom Carper, who was then a member of the House, Rep. Mike Castle, and Governor Mario Cuomo. During the Clinton administration, Paul served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Employment Standards Administration. He now serves as Chief Strategist with Federal Street Strategies. And finally, Maria Meyer is a former senior leadership staffer and served as director of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, as well as the Senate Democratic Diversity Initiative. In 2017, she founded her own practice where she helps clients build inclusive environments. Her newest venture in development, We Are the People, is a community of support and training for underrepresented voices in public service. Over the past decade, Maria has counseled over 1,500 individuals nationally and abroad on career and personal development and has spoken to hundreds of others on issues related to diversity, U.S. politics, and public service. So with that, uh, Dr. Drutman, you are now recognized for five minutes. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Chair Kilmer. It's such a a great honor to to be with you all, and I'm so delighted that you are uh, addressing this crucial uh, question of expertise. The work that you are doing as a committee is so important because Congress is so important. And as as you know, expertise matters. I mean, I I fear I'm stating the obvious a little bit because I'm sure as, you know, as you know, you're constantly engaging in complicated questions of policymaking and that once you start asking questions, you learn that things are not as simple as they often first appear. And the challenges we face as a nation are immense as is the pressure to act on them. And knowledge is, power. Expertise is power. And if you want Congress to have power, Congress has to invest in knowledge because without knowledge, the power is elsewhere. The power is in the hands of the lobbyists who come with their experts and their studies. The uh, power is in the hands of the executive branch and the career bureaucrats who bring expertise and knowledge. And over the years, Congress has become more and more dependent on these outside experts. And I I think I have some slides which hopefully will come through at this moment. Um, Ah, technology. Uh, Okay, so slide number one uh, is just a, you know, broad time trend of the total congressional staffing levels, which you can see have have declined since the, the, you know, flattened out and declined since the mid 90s, particularly in the House. Uh, Next. and this is committee staffing level. There was a, a, a tremendous decline in committee staffing uh, in 95 when Newt Gingrich centralized a lot of power and, and the House has never really recovered. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is staffing for support agencies, uh, GAO in green, uh, CRS in red. And as you can see, there's a, a flattening or decline. Uh, uh, next. Uh, This, I I think, is particularly important. This is the spending on lobbying expenditures compared to what the House and the Senate combined spend on themselves. Uh, Almost double now the money spent on private lobbying, and that's just reported lobbying expenditures. Uh, There's a lot more shadow lobbying compared to what the House and the Senate spend on itself. Uh, I think that's the last slide, right? Oh, no, sorry, one more. Uh, and this is this is what the, the pay for uh, uh, legislative director has been in constant dollars. And uh, as you all know, the opportunities to work in the private sector uh, for the staffers at this position are just incredible. And it makes it very hard to to keep folks who, you know, have a family, want to, you know, buy a house, you know, and, and do, anyway. So the competition is tremendous. So all of these slides, basic idea is that Congress has just not kept pace. Uh, You know, I I understand why a lot of folks in Congress might be hesitant to to invest more in Congress because Congress is unpopular and you're worried about the ad that says that you voted to increase your own budget. But there's a thing, somebody has to stick up for Congress as an institution. And if it's not you all, who the heck is going to do it? 
Uh, I think one of the reasons that Congress has become so dysfunctional is precisely because Congress has outsourced expertise to lobbyists to the executive branch. And there's not that independent policy deliberation capacity because the expertise is elsewhere. Obviously, you all feel Congress is an important institution or else you'd be doing something else with your time. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the, uh, there are just not that many voters out there who are single issue size of government voters. And if you're losing a campaign because you voted to increase the budget of Congress, you might have other problems. I, you know, I think that's a, that's a it's political calculus. If people want to have faith in Congress, Congress needs to live up to that. Uh, where, where do you put the staff? I think one of the things that we've learned in this crisis uh, is that you can actually do a fair amount of work remotely. So maybe not everybody needs to be in the crammed offices in in the, the house office buildings and district offices could also house a lot of policy policy experts without the high cost of living in dc uh, bottom line if you don't provide expanded funding for your own in-house expertise you all are going to be dependent on somebody else whether it's lobbyists uh, executive branch career bureaucrats your, your constituents expect the best representation from you and you know i think you all owe it to them to hire and keep the smartest, most knowledgeable, diverse staff that you can find. So I think I'm at zero. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Drummond. Uh, next up, Mr. Braithwaite, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Vice. Uh, thank you, Chair Kilmer, and, and good morning. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Graves and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's roundtable. Um, I'd also like to thank your staffs who helped uh, to bring us together today. Uh, as way of background, and as Chair Kilmer stated, I had the pleasure of working for six years as the Executive Director of the Congressional Black Caucus from 2001 to 2007. Uh, in that role, I helped coordinate the day-to-day -day activities of the CBC and worked under three chairs for the caucus over the years. Weaver, a member of this select committee, is an outstanding member of that caucus, and as a past chair of the CBC, uh, I had the opportunity to work closely with him, and I thank him for his service to Congress and always seemingly having uh, the right words to say at the right time. Um, but on that note, I, I should also thank all of the members and their staffs for their service. As the chair noted, uh, the current environment with the pandemic and the racial justice protests that are going across the country. Uh, I'm sure has put a strain on 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 your staffs and and on you personally, and and I know it's not easy, but but uh, but thank you for for your service. Um, now, when you work for a congressional member organization or a CMO uh, like the Congressional Black Caucus, you are deemed to be a shared employee, uh, and with the CBC, you really are uh, working for all of the members. So you definitely were shared. Uh, there were three staffers of the CBC when I worked there. Uh, communications director, a director of special projects, and myself. Uh, when I left the caucus in 2007, there were 43 members of the caucus at the time. Um, it still remains for me the best job that I've had in Washington from both a professional and personal learning uh, perspective. I wanted to briefly talk about a few areas that I believe can be improved in the operations of the CMOs. As you all likely know, the staff of the CMOs, much like your personal staff and committee staff, play an important role uh, in the workings of Congress. Um, but I, I believe that we really do have, you know, two staffs in Congress, uh, shared employees and non-shared employees. And I worked for the CBC. One of my busy, biggest headaches while on the Hill was doing payroll each month for the staff due to the shared employee rules. It literally was the most difficult part of my job. Uh, even if you had a month-to-month -month schedule set up with member offices, something would always come up and you'd be scrambling to get on a member's payroll before the deadline each month, which always was the 15th of the month. Um, and as the CBC gained more members of Congress and specifically in the Senate and became bicameral, bicameral uh, there was no practical mechanism for senators to contribute to the salaries and benefits of the caucus. That really should be addressed as as some CMOs do have members of the Senate, even not if not formally, uh, informally, they are members of, of the organization and I know would want to contribute. But switching back and forth uh, staff and going on the Senate payroll 
uh, and then back onto the house just practically is is not is not possible. Office space was also a, a big issue, and and I know office space on the hill is a premium, uh, but merging the staff, the CMO staff, with the existing personal office staff, uh, with the chair of the CMO. Uh, was very difficult. I mean, they, the chair has to provide office space, office equipment uh, for the new staff in a very limited office space. So having dedicated office space for CMO staff would help tremendously. Uh, and it would also get rid of, uh, of, of those staffers having to use intern desks uh, for the extra employees when you merge in with the personal office staff, given the, given the tight quarter. Um, and really to recruit and attract the best talent uh, to CMOs, you know, the logistical aspects of working for a CMO need to be on par with if you worked for a member in their personal office or if you worked on the committee staff. Uh, opportunities to travel to member districts or to policy events were not readily available for CMO staff because it was always a question of who was going to pay for it. Most of that always fell to the chair. Uh, but those exposures, those professional opportunities allow staff to gain expertise and to gain hands on experience. Um, uh, you know, having a dedicated budget uh, to, to do those things would make it, you know, much more feasible for, for staff to be able to, to do the work that they do. So having a budget that included salaries and travel and student loans uh, would always, would, 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 would alleviate uh, those challenges. Lastly, I think Congress should look at creating incentives to, to retain the staff in successive Congresses. You know, hiring a staff for just two years does not allow the staff enough time to gather and gain institutional uh, knowledge. Uh, among the most memorable experiences for me was, was the weekly lunches. I mean, we were given the opportunity to prepare policy proposals and legislative ideas and organize meetings with cabinet officials. So really important stuff uh, uh, that we were able to do with organized CODELs. But uh, in conclusion, I just want uh, to, to underline that, you know, the improvements that could be made in the, that I've outlined are, are really would be helpful for staff. And, you know, I know the hard part is is figuring out where the disagreements are and working through those. So hopefully in the next Congress, some of these ideas can be put into practice and, and taken up uh, as the Congress uh, as the Congress starts. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate today, and I look forward to answering your questions uh, that you might have for me. Thank you, Mr. Braithwaite. Uh, finally, Ms. Meyer, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you and good morning, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Graves, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion on building internal expertise in Congress. To begin, I'd like to align myself with the comments of the previous two speakers. And I will add my perspective as a former Hill staffer, as you heard in my bio, who served in uh, leadership positions in both the House and the Senate. And also as someone has continued to dedicate her profession towards the ideals while I held on the Hill. And those are that I really believe our democracy is stronger when it's fully inclusive and reflective of the people it represents. In addition, I truly believe that our democratic institutions deserve the best and the brightest. Therefore, we need to invest in and develop the talent of those who would commit themselves to public service. Like Mr. Braithwaite, I was an executive director of a congressional member organization, in my case, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And it's this experience that brings me here today to speak out in support of integrating CMOs more fully within the official structure of the Congress. And that's not to further any one agenda, but to better serve the American people. CMOs are an important vehicle for engaging more Americans in the workings of Congress especially those who might not engage directly with their individual members. At a time when this faction, dissatisfaction with Congress is at an all time high, we need to find ways to engage our voters in the workings of what you are doing on a daily basis. I know that people say all politics is local, but sometimes we do need to bump issues to a national stage to understand the impacts and see the results of what you're doing in Congress. CMOs can and do speak to and for communities that are not limited by congressional districts or state boundaries. They can and do provide a deeper level of expertise on issues that impact policy and legislation that affect large segments of the American population. In addition, by fully integrating these offices within Congress, they'll be allowed to participate in important programs that personal offices do, such as the one that provides funds to pay congressional interns. 
By doing so, you're creating pathways for future staffers and maybe even a future member of Congress. As your committee addresses the wide range of issues that impact how Congress functions, I will also encourage you to look at how you invest in your greatest resource, your staff. My last job on the Hill, as you heard, was directing the Senate Democratic Diversity Initiative. It was an office that was created under the direction of the former Senate Democratic leader, Harry Reid. We were charged with assisting Senate offices to increase their staff diversity. During my nearly six year tenure there, I also worked with house offices and created some professional development training sessions where I saw a need. It was there that I regularly saw the impact that current policies on staffing had on retaining talent, as well as the impact it had on the critical goal of developing a more diverse and inclusive workforce in Congress. We know that being able to recruit talent is only part of the HR formula. Retaining that talent, especially in a place like Congress, where institutional memory is critical, requires not only investing compensation for staff, but also investing in their professional development and providing an opportunity for growth. I speak from experience. I left my first job on the Hill far sooner than I ever wanted to, but saddled with student loan de debt and living costs of Washington, D.C., staying there was simply not tenable given the salary for junior staffers with no other sources of support. I was one of the fortunate ones. I was able to return to the Hill years later but I have had countless conversations with professionals of all ages from diverse backgrounds who desperately want to be in public service, but cannot see a way to afford taking on a position on the Hill or to stay in their congressional role as their life circumstances change. Thereby, they're contributing to the statistics outlined by Mr. Drentman of talent loss and the impact that that has on the functioning of Congress. This phenomenon has implications for the efforts to diversify congressional staff at senior levels and on staff on committees, because often this requires years of experience working on the Hill in that particular field. And it impacts not just communities of color, but all would-be public servants who come from socioeconomic backgrounds that simply don't allow for them to intern for free or work at low paying junior positions to gain a foothold on their career ladder. I believe you'll agree that staff are an important part of the process in helping you achieve your legislative visions and goals. And I am heartened by the work that's already been undertaken in recent years to address some of these issues, in particular, the efforts of your committee to strengthen the effectiveness of Congress. Again, I thank the chair, the vice chair, and the members who have joined us here today to address this important issue, and especially to your staff who works tirelessly behind the scenes to create this opportunity. I look forward to a dialogue and I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Terrific, thanks to all three of you uh, for your uh, testimony. We'll now move into questions. Um, and Ms. Meyer, I'd love to start with you. You know, um, I'm just curious if you can give us uh, some ideas or recommendations for, for strengthening the CMOs or for, or for raising um, minority vo voices or perspectives in policy debates. You know, we've talked about the need for expertise to inform the policymaking process, but, but diverse perspectives are part of that too. And I'd love to get your counsel as to um, what this committee might be able to uh, recommend in that regard. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I have several thoughts on the issue. Uh, Again, I align myself with the comments of Mr. Braithwaite. Uh, he and I shared or served at the same time. He was at the Congressional Black Caucus when I was at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, and, and know his commitment to these issues. So everything he said about integrating CMOs, and again, I will return to my point that this isn't a partisan issue. It's not a one agenda issue because CMOs cover a wide span. But the fact that staff there is, or senior staff is so consumed with administrative issues like making payroll because you have to move three people onto 20 different payrolls every single month. So having the same administrative support and structures that personal offices do will allow them the freedom to do what they do best, which is to focus on policy issues going deep. How do these impacts, how these issues impact rural America? How do they impact African Americans, Hispanic Americans? Uh, in the resources again that were afford, are afforded personal office or even as if they are treated as committee staff 
will simply uh, allow them to be those experts. In terms of how you create an inclusive environment at all levels, I think today's meeting is a perfect example. You have diversity in background and experiences and in identity in those who are addressing you here today. It may seem overly simplified, but ensuring that when you have these discussions, you invite and reach out to people who may not ordinarily be your go-tos on the lists. There are plenty of experts in areas that, that don't get tapped. Ensuring that you've got a diversity of backgrounds and opinions when these happen. They make very strong statements that you have these faces sitting at the table who are on C-SPAN who can speak of their experiences or their, their work in these communities and these issue areas. So that's, that's one simple solution, but it goes a long way to furthering uh, your percept the perception that you are committed to inclusion. Thanks very much. And Mr. Braithwaite, I wanted to ask you, you know, I, when I read your introduction uh, and your bio, you know, obviously part of the role of the CBC is to coordinate policy initiatives, you know, both domestic and foreign policy. I'm just curious if, you know, going back to your, your old role, what would have made your job easier? And are there recommendations that we um, can, can make through this committee that would um, help drive expertise for the type of policy and uh, that organizations are, are so active in, um, in participating in? You, you know, um, as the caucus grew, we didn't have the capacity to grow the staff. Uh, you know, in a, in a perfect world, I would have loved to have had, you know, people who had expertise in foreign policy, folks who had expertise in, in health care. I mean, but we were sort of, you know, forced to do all of the different functions uh, that you need to do to, to organize an event. I used to say that, you know, uh, whether it was reserving a room or getting the speakers or making sure um, uh, that the members had their 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 statements. I mean, we had to do all of that. So a ca capacity uh, was was one was one issue. But as I mentioned, with the payroll situation, uh, you know, you literally could would have to dedicate half a day, uh, Chair Kilmer, to if not more, to run around literally office to office to get a to get a signature to. Uh, to get on someone's payroll, and because the Congress only, or the House only pays once a month, if you miss that fifteenth deadline. Uh, you know, it would be another ten days before you could get paid. Uh, so, so just streamlining those things, I think, uh, would 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 have been much 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 easier. Um, and I'm and you know, I, I I didn't get to say this, but I would, uh, you know, I would since I'm a few years removed, I would actually do a survey of the current CMOs and just ask them informally, hey, you know, some of the efforts that, that have been undertaken over the last several years that you members have done, uh, just getting an idea of what the real life experience is for them today. I got a little bit of that, uh, you know, from a little bit of due diligence that I did, but I think, you know, informally allowing them to do it in a, uh, in a way to, to give you con their contributions now, I think would be good or their feedback would be good. Terrific. Thank you. And uh, I'll hold my questions for Dr. Drutman and uh, turn it over to Vice Chair Graves. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and to our guests for your presentations. And I, I want to sort of just continue the conversation about the congressional member organizations. Um, I, I think we all know that some of the restrictions or limitations oftentimes are in place, maybe to prevent a shadow leadership uh, uh, opportunity for someone because there's a lot of, you know, these, these organizations can grow in size and, and, and can have support and everything within those. But I was, I, I want to go just sort of a little different direction because this committee is really focused on how can we bring the house together? How can we develop relationships? How can we reach consensus and through bipartisanship and this committee has been a great example of, of doing what many thought couldn't be done uh, through that. And, and when I think about the eligible congressional member organizations, it strikes me that they're all partisan. And uh, that, you know, you have a Republican organization and you have three, uh, I guess, Democrat organizations, even though they're labeled as congressional organizations. And, and I think there's been a little, you know, uh, history between the organizations not accepting members from the other party if of, of 
if there was an interest. In fact, Chair Kilmer joined me uh, for the first time ever, a Democrat presented to the Republican Study Committee. And uh, it, it was it was a really great experience, and it was needed. And uh, he, he was welcomed and, and warmly welcomed and did a great job. Um, and I was able to go and visit with the new Democrat coalition as well, and great experience. Um, but there seems to be a history of very partisan uh, makeups within these organizations. So uh, to, to both of those that have worked within them as executive directors and such or, or worked in those capacities, what are your thoughts on that? Should they be? Bipartisan in any way? Should the Congressional Black Caucus accept members from both parties, or or do they? And then maybe they do, and I don't know. Or, or the Congressional Hispanic Caucus do the same, and, and such. What would your thoughts be? Well, well I'll start off, uh, Vice Chair Graves. The, the Congressional Black Caucus does uh, accept members of uh, of both parties. Your former colleague, uh, Congresswoman Love, was a member. Uh, of the CVC and, and years ago, going back all the way to the 90s, uh, uh, former Congressman uh, Gary Franks from Connecticut was also a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. And so the caucus has a long history of, uh, of, of accepting bipartisan members of the caucus. And if you could, if you could convince uh, Senator Scott to join the caucus, I'm sure uh, Chairman Clinton would welcome him uh, as well. I know the staff would, especially if they could get right. to their salaries. Um, but but I'll say this. I mean, there are some examples of caucuses that are uh, bipartisan. The Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, chaired by uh, by Congressman Reed and Congressman Gothheimer, uh, work well together. They they um, they actually have a bill on the floor this week around uh, credit reporting uh, and credit reports. Um, so there are examples. I mean, I remember when I was working with the CBC, we did some collaboration, and although it wasn't. Uh, a Republican Democrat uh, caucus. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we did a, we did a, we did regular meetings with the Blue Dogs. We called it the Black and Blue meeting. Um, and uh, and I think there are other ways. I mean, but just like how you, Chair Kilmer, and 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 you, Vice Chair Graves, got together and 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 addressed each other's caucus. Some of this just depends on on making the request. Quite frankly, I mean, I don't. I think you know, people don't do it because it hasn't been done. But as soon as you do it. Uh, and one chair does it, the other, the following and successive chairs. And, and again, even with the staff institutional knowledge point that I was bringing up, if you have staff that, that get into doing this um, and seeing you all do it, they will then start collaborating and seeking out opportunities for collaboration as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'll add, if Thank I you. might, Vice Chair Graves, uh, I, I too am uh, several years removed from my position at the Hispanic Caucus. But during my time there, we always remained open to any members, any members of Hispanic Latino uh, descent who wanted to join. And it was uh, the Republicans' choice if they did, that they didn't want to join. And this has history in, in when the rules of the caucus changed. I think uh, what you are referring to is a microcosm of our politics in the US. It doesn't mean that the work of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus is only about Democratic Latinos. It is about Latinos, Hispanics in the US and the issues that, that impact them, legislation that impacts them, the lens through which they approach public policy. And that is expansive, regardless of their political leanings or background. Uh, I absolutely do believe if you go forward and institutionalize congressional member organizations that they do be bipartisan or open to any members and not limited to that. Otherwise, they become a political entity. But uh, the solutions are to s allow them to focus on the issues of the communities. And I think uh, they, the members themselves will agree they're not limited to, to one party. Great. Well, well, thank you both for your testimony and, and your thoughts on this. And, and I agree. I, I think the more that we can provide inclusiveness from both both sides and, and acceptance and, and maybe, as uh, was said earlier, um, the willingness uh, to participate, um, I, I think it's better for the entire House. But uh, thank you both for your, your, your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thanks, Vice Chair Graves. Uh, next up, Chairperson Lofgren. Good morning. Um, you know, I couldn't help but think back to 1995 when 
uh, Newt Gingrich was speaker, and he basically eliminated uh, these member organizations. And listening to Mr. Braithwaite talk about uh, the agony of getting uh, the payroll done, I I get you. We do. I chair the California Democratic delegation. It's forty six members, and we have to do that. And it's really it's a workaround, though. It was a workaround because it was eliminated. And I'm glad that the workaround worked because there is tremendous value in some of these member organizations. I mean the. CBC and the CHC play invaluable roles in Congress and for the country. So the, the tension is how do you support that, but understand that really the, the, the transparency of the Congress itself is more in the committee structure than in the member organization. So there's always going to be a tension between the committee structure and all the rules that require transparency. Uh, a lot of the member organizations have outside groups that provide funding or they're affiliated with. That is quite valuable, but it's not it's it's contraindicated in terms of the committee structure. So it's a tension that works, I think. And the question is how to support that without eliminating the tension that actually serves the country pretty well. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Mr. Braithwaite. You've you've been through this a long time. Yeah, uh, Chairperson Lofgren, you you raise a good point. I mean, uh, on the tension and the, and the productivity that I think comes from that tension. Um, look, I, I I and 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 I go back. I remember when uh, when I was asking members uh, when I first got there, and I remember former Congressman, the late Congressman uh, Donald Payne, mentioning. What uh, what Speaker Gingrich did in his effort to try to undermine the work of the of the of the what was called I think at that time legislative service organizations LS LSOs yep. uh, they had budgets they had office space over in the Ford Building and um, you know they 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 probably became quite powerful and they could rival uh, the the committee structure I don't know that that really happens but you know it, politics is politics and you got to count your numbers and. And do the work and if you're driving towards trying to create good public policy and you want good people to come you can't make life that much difficult i mean i, I if you all paid if the congress paid enough they might not have ever been able to move me out of my job i mean <laughs> i really enjoyed because i like the politics and i always used to think that you know mrs jones and mr smith think that someone in congress is trying to help them get their social security check or trying to do police reform or trying to do election reform to make it easier to vote um, um you know and so i love the aspect of doing that but you know if you make it difficult and you and you as you know as you as you grow your family as you get older you know when i'm 30 i can run around and do all the gathering of those signatures when i'm when i'm 10 years post that you're like why am i still having to do this so it's that kind of burden that i think could easily be eliminated or alleviated maybe not eliminated but alleviated by just having some, you know, here's your budget, all the members, you know, whether you have three or two or one uh, employees, I mean, I think it's arbitrary, but if you are caucus and you're doing work, set the rules, create an audit function. You know, I think there are smart ways to do this that could allow for, for really good productivities and you'd keep people in their jobs. I'll, I'll just, listening to Mr. Graves and, and, and the chair on the, um, you know, the nonpartisan groups, they're very few. And I think that really reflects that on many issues, there is an actual division between the views of the parties on a number of issues. I mean, not every issue, but many issues. And I think that's reflected in the groups that that organize. I was thinking back to the time I was invited to uh, present to the uh, Freedom, the Liberty Caucus, which is a little bit to the right of the Freedom Caucus. And it was on um, NSA surveillance issues because we had a left-right effort on Fourth Amendment issues. We have a Fourth Amendment Caucus that is bipartisan, and there is bipartisan agreement on those issues. But on many, there just are disagreements among the parties, and I think it's reflected by the member organizations. So. And that's not necessarily wrong. I mean, uh, you know, we have competing ideas 
uh, about how best to address the challenges that face the country in some areas, not every. And we, uh, we present those competing ideas to the American public uh, to choose the future they want to move forward. So, uh, you know, I love working in a bipartisan way. One of the members of this committee was my main partner on the Farm Worker Modernization Act. You know, people said we could never do a bipartisan uh, bill for immigration in farm labor, but we did, and it was a wonderful experience. But, uh, you know, we have to be willing to work, but there has to be agreement. And so on many of these issues, there, there really isn't. So I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. I think I've used up more than my time. Thanks. Well, thanks so much. Uh, next up, Representative Brooks. Sorry, I think I see her. Susan Brooks. She may have her sound off. We'll give it one more try. Congresswoman Brooks. Let me just text her. Representative Brooks, are you ready? Can you hear us? Oops, looks like a bad connection. Uh, let me go on. We'll come back to her. Uh, Mr. Newhouse. Let's see, do we have Mr. Newhouse on? Okay, I'm going to Mr. Timmons. Hello. Good. Uh is that, is that new I, I can wait my there turn if you want to go on, Bill. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, sorry. Just pushed, okay. the wrong, pushed the wrong button. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, um, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. I appreciate the panelists this morning uh, sharing your thoughts on a couple of very important issues here. Um, now I made my screen disappear that showed the names, but our first uh, Dr. Dr Dr Drotman? Drotman, yes. Drotman. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, I appreciated your presentation. And, and, and I guess I should say on, at, at the onset, you know, I, I do think the lobbying committee provide, or excuse me, community provides us a valuable uh, uh, resource in bringing expertise to the table. But I also appreciate the importance of making sure that we're not totally dependent on um, outside expertise that we have some some of that uh, ability with within our offices so in, in that re in that light um, looking at the graphs that you presented to us I think it it shows that the uh, policy staffing levels um, in the I think it was in the 1970s, it increased quite a, quite dramatically, maybe almost in the neighborhood of tripling. And so, my my question uh, was, if you feel that that uh, that the intended result of um, uh, relying less on outside expertise was achieved by that increase uh, in staffing, and and did that did that gap between the legislative branch spending and the expenditure on the part of the lobbying community that that gap closed. So any observations you can make there? Uh, yeah, so the Congress in the 1970s was uh, very different than the Congress of today. It was a much more committee and even subcommittee based institution in which a lot less was driven by leadership that was Congress was really at its height of bipartisanship. Uh, the number of committee hearings was was much more. It was really a, a, a very deliberative process uh, with a lot of members working together across the aisles uh, and committees having real expertise to develop real uh, legislation. I mean, you look at something like uh, like airline deregulation, you know, which was a major uh, major, I think, achievement of Congress in that era in 1978. And that was really the process of a, of a long, uh, the result of a, a very long deliberative committee 
process driven by staffers uh, who you know, were really, really top-notch experts. Now, even into the 80s, I think a lot of folks think back on the 1986 tax reform bill as kind of a high point of uh, bipartisan congressional work. And you know that's a process that's really uh, driven by having a, a lot of expert staff at the Joint Committee on Taxation who really helped make that, that process possible, as well as bipartisan leadership. Uh, so one of the things that, that comes out of that period is that you have staff who, who are really experts and are really there for a long term and build these bipartisan relationships uh, among them. And there's a level of professional investment uh, in that capacity. And that, that just doesn't exist today in the same way it did back then. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I certainly agree with you that lobbyists do provide a lot of valuable expertise. Uh, but the, I think the challenge is that all of that expertise uh, comes in with a particular agenda. And one of the challenges for staffers and members is knowing what's BS and what's not. And uh, that's that's something that that requires expertise uh, and requires knowing who you can trust and, and who's blowing smoke up your rear end. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. That's uh, uh, very true. Very true. Um, so thank you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Braith Braithwaite. Um, I think it's valuable for us to. Um, you know, if you if you forget history, what's the saying? You're doomed to repeat it, right? So, if we look, if we look back in the 1990s, when the LSOs were abolished um, in favor of going to the CMOs, um, could could we? Is there a simple answer to the question as to why that happened? Is there a reason that we should be aware of so that we don't make the same mistake twice, perhaps? Yeah, and uh, Congressman Newhouse, I think you you're you're all right. If you if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. Um, but I think um, the, the committees, the the LSOs, had gotten too powerful um, on both the left and the right uh, in in the eyes of the speaker. Um, and I think it really did start a consolidation of leadership being able to make a lot of decisions, whether it's a Democratic speaker or a Republican speaker. And I think. You know, um, you know, frontline uh, uh, rank and file members, you know, want to have more of a say in, in the caucuses was one way to uh, exert your exert your uh, your uh, your voices uh, collectively, whether it's by state delegation or uh, or the caucuses as they as they're known today um, that are that are most active in in Congress. And so, you know, I don't think there's any fear that should be uh brought about by by limiting their 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 access to, to have good staff uh you know i think in an open democracy process we should we should welcome that okay i appreciate that maybe that's the lesson that we went uh maybe too far to the uh top down approach too much too much power in the uh, uh in leadership so um, anyway, well, I appreciate the uh, uh, your value, all of your valuable contributions to this conversation, and uh, I look forward to continuing that even after our meeting today. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate the the time. And I'll you yield back. Thanks very much, Mr. Newhouse. I am conscious that votes were just called, um, and we have three members who are in Group One who have all stepped away to go do that. Um, I'm inclined to keep rolling, which would um, put uh, Mr. Timmons into the batter's box since our other three are, uh, are um, away voting. I don't think I see Cleaver on, just checking. Yeah, I believe he went to go vote as well. So uh, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Drutman, I appreciate um, the, the the letter that you're speaking about regarding the additional $500 million for the um, legislative branch's budget. Could you talk about where, how that money you think would be best spent if it was uh, approved and additional 10% was spent? Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I would recommend investing it in committees 
uh, because I think that's where you see uh, the, the, the real policy expertise being developed. Um, you know, I think we, we've had a discussion about CMOs, and I think certainly they provide a great opportunity uh, for developing expertise. And you know, one 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 thing that you could think about it. I know some of you are concerned about that these uh, CMOs are not always bipartisan. That you, know, you could think about ways in which to encourage bipartisanship by allocating extra funds for CMOs that meet a certain standard of bipartisan membership. If that's if that's a concern, but I, I think the, you know, the the real real need for Congress is to develop long term expertise, and probably the best place to do that is in the committees. So that would be my recommendation. So you know, ten percent increase sounds sounds great. My question is, are we missing the mark here? I mean, in my mind, if you go back to 1995 and the members of Congress proactively deny themselves a, a cost of living adjustment, and the, the, the legislative branch has uh, thus been impeded by our ability to pay staff, because if we hadn't continually denied that cost of living adjustment, I think member's salary would be 220 something, 230. And um, then our chiefs would make more, our LDs would make more, our staff would make more because we wouldn't have 1.3, 1.4 million dollars in our MRA. It would probably be more like 1.8, 1.9. So, um, and obviously that's not a 10% increase in the legislative budget. That would be like a, four, a very large increase in the legislative budget. So, I mean, is 10%, are we just kind of nibbling around the edges or do we have a more systemic problem? I mean, you know, if, I think you're absolutely right that 10% is, is small potatoes. And, you know, if you're going to do it, you know, why, why not, why not go big? Right. I mean, it, it, I think, I, you know, I think if, if you doubled the budget, uh, that would, that would be a tremendous impact. And, you know, I think it's important to put, put all this in context, right? And the federal budget is 4.8 trillion that's trillion with a t legislative appropriations and which includes the architect of the capital and security is just under 4 billion so that's 0.08% of the federal budget for uh, uh legislative appropriations or put another way 99.92% of the federal budget goes elsewhere and you know even if you're concerned about government spending actually having better oversight of the executive branch could actually save taxpayers money. I just saw a headline uh, that the GAO found that the Treasury Department was sending, you know, stimulus checks to dead people. And that, you know, that's, that's oversight. Uh, and the more you invest in that oversight, you actually wind up saving taxpayers money, I think. So I, I think it's a tremendous investment. It's a tremendous value. And, you know, uh, if if people are unhappy with with Congress and you know the only way to make support for Congress greater is to invest in a Congress that delivers more results for the American people. So I, yeah, it, if you're going to go big, if you're going to increase the budget. I say double it. Why not? Well, I, I tend to <laughs> think the ten percent is insufficient. I think um, given the, the the severity of our. Uh, decision making for the next really two two congresses i mean we're not going to do anything between now and november because of the election but after the election i i think that we need to really look hard at, at this issue because um we got 30 trillion dollars worth of debt we're going to have to have substantial cuts we're going to have to do some pretty painful things and we need to invest in the the people that will be responsible for those decisions and um, we need to make sure that we have the best people looking at this issue. Um, so I, I really do. I appreciate uh, Mr. Chairman, you hosting this uh, conversation. And I um, hope that we can find a way to appropriately fund the legislative branch because the work we're doing here in the next few years could make or break uh, our country. So um, I, I appreciate it. And I look forward to having this conversation further. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much. I am just looking to um, see if any of our three who were in round one of voting are back on. It does not appear so. So I'm going to invite um, if uh, any of my colleagues who've already had a, a round of questions, if they would like to um, uh, uh, ask a question. Um, 
feel free to chime in. I, I do have another, for, for Mr. Drutman, you know, I, I'd like to explore the idea of virtual workspaces for additional staff. I, I think that's probably something we didn't really think about or, or consider um, pre-COVID, but it does seem to make sense given the limited physical workspace on the Hill. Any downsides to that model that we should be considering? Um, uh, you know, obviously we wouldn't have to provide office space for those employees, but we would still have to pay them. Um, you know, how do we how do we sell that? And uh, and you know, while you're at it, any other kind of additional out of the box ideas for building capacity? Things we haven't thought of or talked about? Well, you know, I, I do think that you know we we've learned in this uh, pandemic crisis that people can actually be productive working from remote locations. And, you know, I'm certainly not, not an expert on remote work, but you know, I, I do think that there's there, there's value, tremendous value in, in in person interactions, but that a lot of work that people do, particularly when it's research oriented, can be done uh, remotely. You know, in terms of out of the box thinking, you know, I, there, there's a tremendous untapped resource in almost every congressional district, and that is universities. Uh, and I, you know, I think there are a lot of people in public policy schools, public health schools, uh, in law schools who, you know, would be thrilled to provide some of their time to help members of Congress and help uh, the, the American people. Uh, think through some some really complicated issues and bring tremendous expertise that is you know as as close as you get to the independent and you know have have ties to to uh, uh, communities where where you know where the universities are so I think those are those are certainly ideas that that are you know I mean, there were there were some ideas in in the uh, the APSA report, uh, which I know you all discussed last week with uh, 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 Professor Ruth Block Rubin, uh, who was on the the uh, subcommittee, the APSA subcommittee that I chaired on on staffing. Uh, you know, investing more in the, uh, the CRS and the GAO, and you know, perhaps thinking about some some in-house think tanks that could provide nonpartisan expertise for Congress sort of in the the model of the the long long lost office of technology assessment which is perpetually uh, discussed bringing back in in some being brought back in some form uh, but at the end of the day there I think there's no substitute for just Congress spending money on itself. And it's it, it's always seemed odd to me that this is the one institution in the world that effectively gets to set its own budget, uh, and yet there's this this skittishness in in actually doing that. Uh, and you know, I understand everybody wants to 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 respect uh, the the American taxpayer, but I think there's a tremendous bargain for the American taxpayer. In investing in expertise in Congress, and there is a, a five trillion dollar federal budget to oversee, uh, and by even if you double the the spending on Congress as an institution, it's still less than zero point two percent of the total federal budget. Thank you. Um, I. Chairperson Lofgren or uh, Mr. Newhouse, do either of you have any additional questions? Uh, no, I think this has been very helpful and um, the panelists have been uh, enlightening, so thank you. Mr. Newhouse or any uh, any other committee members? Okay. Well, um, with that, uh, I'd like to, to thank Dr. Drutman and Mr. Braithwaite and Ms. Meyer for sharing your expertise and your perspectives with us today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, everyone for their willingness to keep the committee's work moving forward. My apologies to our uh, committee members who had to, had to go vote. I know that um, they were eager to uh, uh, ask a, a question as well. And, um, I'm sorry that uh, they didn't get that opportunity. Um, and again, uh, to repeat what our terrific witnesses said, 
I also just want to express gratitude to the staff of the committee for putting this hearing together and their great work. As we know, uh, uh, a lot of the progress that's made in Congress happens because of the great work of staff. So thank you so much. And with that, this discussion stands adjourned. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>